That's the biggest secret weapon that will get you gigs. There's all this talk of like how working for exposure is not good. But I think sometimes the conversation is wrong a little bit. At first it can feel like you don't have any leads because you don't. So I would just smell like kitchen grease and cigarettes. I was a sophomore in high school. There's so many people that believe learning the cool licks is what's going to get them the gig. I have a lot of younger musicians that follow me that have been asking me, how do I start gigging? So in this video, I'm going to give my advice to younger musicians for how you should start gigging, as well as tell the story of my very first paid gig, which involves me putting on a wig and playing Careless Whisper in a cemetery. But first I wanted to ask some of my musician friends about how they started gigging and hear their first gig stories. The thing that I did in Pittsburgh was go to jam sessions like five or six nights a week Whoa. just for whatever I could find, yeah. uh, jazz or soul or bluegrass, like whatever was happening. Were and you that, still in college at that point? Yeah, that was my first summer here, not going back to Boston. I just figured if I was going to be here like working a like a food service job and stuff, I, yeah. I wanted to make my time worth it by like going to sessions as much yeah. as I could, which I think was really good for me at the time. Like it taught me how to play in a lot of different scenarios, like a lot of different types of music, but maybe more importantly, it just like introduced me to a bunch of people. Any music scene is about the relationships involved. So unlike maybe a lot of other industries, you can't like put together a resume that will get you the gigs that you want, I think, yeah. no matter how accomplished you are, especially because this is a world where people are throwing around names all the time and yeah. you can't really fact check any of that stuff. <laughs> uh, so the best thing you can do is build a rapport with people who you respect and want to work with. But that would be my gut reaction, is yeah. that relationships are yeah. are the biggest thing. And build them by meeting people in the scene, like jam sessions and stuff. Yeah, and I guess something else that I think about a lot, there's all this talk of like how exposure, working for exposure is not good. Mm. Um, and I, I'm all for that, like we should all be paid for what we have to do. But I think sometimes the conversation is wrong a little bit, where it's like you have to have some, some rate for what you do right out of the gate that's like indicative of your being qualified to do like this top level yeah. professional work. And I know that for myself, like when I was 19, 20, 21, like I didn't have professional grade work to offer people. Exactly. I don't recommend that you do a bunch of work for free at that age and just like make your rate zero dollars, but open yourself up to like working with people for the experience of working with them, booking gigs that might pay a little bit less because you get to work with someone that you really wanna yeah. work with and impress. And over time that becomes like, you can set your weight rate higher and higher and like market yourself as a professional more and more. But I think it's a gradual scale. I don't yeah. think it's like out of the gate, you know? Yeah, you always hear like know your worth and like, oh, I never work for free and all that. And like, there's two things. One, it's like, when you're just starting out, you're worth a zero. It's like, <laughs> no, it's like, <laughs> yeah. that's what, no right. one knows who you are and you're not yeah. very good. So right. why should anyone call you? Right. So it's right. like, you have to kind of like just whatever you can get. And then the second half of that is like, and I heard someone else say this is like, rethink what you mean by getting paid. Like, like getting yeah. paid doesn't have to be a dollar amount. It can be, I'm meeting all of these people that are already working and I'm getting to play with all these people, you know, that play with all these other people. There is value in like learning how to play with people, you know, when you don't know how to do that. I remember being young enough and inexperienced enough that I felt like I was being overpaid for things. Yeah. Obviously I didn't make them lower my rate if that was the <laughs> instance, but now I feel like because of all that time I put in, now I name people a high price and I almost like it when they cringe because I'm like, this is what I'm worth. Like I'm yeah. confident now that yeah. I'm worth that much. Yeah. And people have to meet me where I'm at. But that, I couldn't have said that 10 years ago. And that's yeah. like a process. You have to hit that point. My first paid gig was playing trombone. Whoa. You <laughs> trombone? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I don't Hold know up. if I can say <laughs> that I played <laughs> trombone. I had a like a brass quartet gig Whoa. that was on the steps of, of a church when I was like, I don't know, 15 or 16 or something. And I got paid for that. That was yeah. I had played a lot at that point, mm -hmm. different instruments in different settings, but like that was the first time I got handed a check. That was the first time I had the experience of like, is my, am I really worth this much? Because I don't think what I just did was worth this much. I'm glad that I had that experience because it also made me realize that when people do pay you something resembling a fair rate you sometimes you have that feeling and you shouldn't you shouldn't bring that number down <laughs> yeah, yeah you have to work to meet meet people where, they, where yeah. they're at but yeah that was my very first one and i think my first guitar gig was somewhere in my freshman 
late freshman year of college. I think it was probably like some kind of private party in the yeah. corner with the keyboard yep. player and a drummer and bassist. When they tell you to keep turning down the whole gig. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yes, one of those. Do you remember like whenever you, that feeling of getting your first paycheck, like making money playing music? Yeah, I thought $100 was a lot of money. Yeah. Like that. That's cool. I actually really like talking to students who don't have any conception of, of money yet, like in yeah. high school who aren't really like participating in the economy where I can be like, look, like, if you play a gig, it could potentially equal an eight-hour day at a coffee shop or yeah. something. Like, that's that's notable. Like, you're, you're logging hours now so that you can make a decent hourly rate at some point yeah. in the future. I feel like not enough people think of being a musician as skilled labor. Like, yeah. it's, we trained for this, yeah. and we go use our training to do something that, you know, 95% of people can't even begin to to do so from that perspective yeah it's it's kind of exciting when you're young and it there is a point in your adulthood i think where you start to be like well dang i do wish i made a little bit more than this standard rate <laughs> yeah. because there's so much prep time that goes into this stuff yeah. but i try to cling to that excitement i felt when i was 19 and got handed that check because it yeah. it is cool to actually be able to sell people your craft yeah your skill. dude thank you so much That's yeah perfect. for sure am i feeling like trash and leaving yes feeling like trash no not leaving what am I answering questions for tonight? <laughs> Is that first cough? I mean, most people I know gig together. So if you have other young people you know that also play and you like them and they like you and you like the same music, gig with them. I mean, you can always gig with, with older players. You can show up at clubs and hustle for stuff. It helps to be... Here's your real talk. It helps to be the guy in town that plays either the instrument that nobody else does or be the person that there aren't that many of. You made a joke about a bass player, and that is not incorrect. <laughs> Be a bass player, you'll you know get called. I made that video on a Saturday night that I didn't have a gig. <laughs> and I was like, That's oh, incredible. Yeah. Did you write that in the video that it was no. Saturday and you had. No. Oh, but I was like, God. I was... Make your own. That's what Patrick would say. Find somebody who's got a storefront or a coffee shop that closes at four and host a, host a night of you know, bands or music or... It doesn't always have to be alcohol involved. I mean, that tends to bring people out. Nobody wants to pay money if they're not gonna drink. That's the trouble with that. I don't even know how I did it. I grew up in a very small town. There was nobody doing anything. So the fact that I played, you know, even, you know, three chords, people were like, oh, call that guy. He's he's a weird guy and he's kind of funny and he'll show up. He'll, he'll show up with his, you know, in his, like, mom's van with his, like, weird keyboard and it'll be great. Could I do the salmon ceviche? That's a terrible choice. That's like the worst thing you can order if you're drinking. If you're gonna drink a lot, by all means, drink, eat nothing but light, uncooked fish. <laughs> Wait, this is a different video. <laughs> you'll, I guarantee you'll never see that fish again. It'll just sit so comfortably <laughs> in your dumb body. <laughs> <clears throat> My first like professional gigs in high school were um, playing a weekly restaurant gig, uh, solo piano at this restaurant, and I. This was in the, this is, you could smoke in bars. So I would just smell like kitchen grease and cigarettes. It, you know, as a sophomore in high school, I'd come <laughs> home with my, my stupid suit that didn't fit with like my Regis Philbin shiny <laughs> shirt. And I would just be like, I would just smell like, like subway trash, like absolute garbage. Uh, you can't smoke anymore, that's good. I played a, a, like a college bar. I couldn't drink, but I could play the college bar. I think it was called the Hickey. St. Bonaventure University, the bar was called Iggy. I think it's still there. <laughs> Ask JD Chase on about this, because he's Mr. St. Bonaventure these days. I can remember playing like Dave Matthews band songs <laughs> on, on, the, on the piano. Who oh, sign up for that? Sign up for my Patreon. I'm gonna play Satellite on solo piano. <laughs> A lot of younger people get stuck in thinking about themselves. I don't want to single it out, but because I am teaching vocalists a lot, I find it's totally like a in your head kind of problem of not realizing that people actually don't need you to be worrying about yourself. You need to worry about your band or you need to worry about the music and then then that's when things will actually start coming to you. So you, you just get called for you know your first gig or whatever, or at jam sessions, like those are things that people will notice. Yeah. It's like, oh, this person is playing for the music. I think and so. so. They'll, they'll think about calling them. Like, I, I directly have came across that. Either I hear it from them, or I can directly infer that, well, they said this about me, and then I got called for this gig. Yeah, yeah. Coincidence? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Obviously you book a lot of your own stuff. So if someone like wants to like start their own group, yeah. should they try to reach out to places? Should they just go do open mics or what? Like yeah. what has your experience been? So I think there's 
there's a bunch of ways to go about this. Yeah. So it's like at first it can feel like you don't have any uh, leads because you mm -hmm. don't. So yeah. you have to treat everything like a potential lead. And then once you get the one lead, then it's going to build into more. Yeah. And so for me, it was going to jam sessions and putting out content and just like letting people know that I could be called for, for gigs. But then with that kind of quickly getting in contact with venues and having my own brand be a thing, use social media, not too much, but use it to have something that represents me, make my website, you know, make all the legit things. And that really paid off because then people don't associate me with like other people that I play with. They might learn about me, but then they'll know that I have like my main project. Yeah, yeah. Also, kind of like a, I don't know if it's like a cheat, right? I'm doing like a lot of gigs that are like background jazz gigs. And then I have my artistic endeavors, which yeah. are more musical moments that are really appropriate for a show. But who says that I can't do a little bit of both? So if I have a restaurant gig that I have a lead on, I'm not lying, but I'm also knowing in my head that there are things that I can get away with after booking the gig and you know playing the popular songs that they want to hear. Because also so many people who book things, they don't know what they want. If I show them like my complicated versions of something, they might not like it at first and then not feel keen to hire me. But if they recognize something, it's usually people's first in. Yeah. And then they'll hear other stuff and then you know, then you'll turn someone into a jazz fan yeah. or whatever yeah. genre it is. Yeah. One of my first gig stories, I think I was 19 or 20, I had been open micing because I, I had a bunch of ideas of things that I wanted to do. I did want to eventually get good enough to lead my own band in a jazz sense. And I also wasn't sure what I wanted to do anyways, mm -hmm. but looking back, this was a really good stepping stone because I went to open mics all the time and I was able to get my nerves out and just yeah. practice, right? Yeah. There was this one particular one at, at a restaurant that I guess um, I had made an impression on a middle-aged man on my version of Tupelo Honey by Van Morrison. Mm -hmm. And I got like an email or maybe a call or something to surprise his daughter at her wedding with father-daughter dance. And that's really sweet. But I was even a little skeptical. I was like, surprise the bride. <laughs> I was like 1920, you know, I'm yeah. like, okay. Yeah. And so back then I didn't have any gear. You know, my chops weren't great. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, okay. And I was so nervous. I think I showed up at the gig like four hours early. I forgot my capo, so I had to go buy another one. Looking back, I'm not very far at all from where I was living, but it felt so far. Because <laughs> yeah. it was like going out for the first time yeah. to like play somewhere yeah. at like this other town. You know, now at this point I'm like, all right, where are we going? New place, all right, let's find a restaurant. You know, like yeah. adventure. But back then it was terrifying. And I go and I'm setting up and the sound guy is also like the DJ. He's already giving me kind of like cold shoulder. Mm. And so I'm like, okay, you know, I don't really know. I don't really have anyone there on my side. I'm supposed to be a surprise. So the bride doesn't even know about me. Yeah. And so the time comes where the, the dad does come and say hi to me. And he's like, thank you so much. So it's super nice people, but it was like a huge hall, like echoey oh. grand ballroom yeah. type of thing. And I only had a small amp. And so I set it up and I asked the sound guy earlier while he was setting up. I didn't realize it was gonna be so big here. Is there any way like, you know, can I use any of your sound? And he told me no. And I didn't know anything about sound that. So I couldn't argue it. I'm like, okay, yeah. I guess I, I, I'm just on my own. Crank it up all the way. Cranked up, it sounds terrible. Yeah. It's an acoustic guitar cranked up all the way. Yeah. So I, and I do it, I'm so nervous. And I don't even think that she can hear me. No one really knows what's going on. And also like the party was so big that like half the people were still talking. So it's echoing and they're trying to have their moment and like they clapped and I know they appreciated it. But I was so ashamed, I packed up, went in my car, it was raining. Oh. I was like, that was so weird and terrible. Yeah. I didn't even know what was gonna happen. But then I looked in the envelope and some bills in there. Yeah, I was like, yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, okay. Yeah. That was crazy, you yeah. know? But then I was like, well, I don't really know these people, so I'm just gonna leave and yeah. here I go. There's obvious stuff that's like, you know, be a student of your instrument, be, be intimate with your instrument and spend a lot of time. Don't be afraid to explore, play it a lot. Like go to jam sessions and open mics and all that kind of stuff because that's that's really where I learned most about how to play with a bunch of different people, play out and like sort of get lost and come back to, you know, a place that I like knew where I was at. Um, it allowed me to kind of explore a lot, a lot more. Then like some of the maybe less obvious stuff. And this is sort of whether you're writing music, whether you're recording other people's music, you're, you know, hired gun, going to play with, with another artist. Something that I always do is think more like a producer than you're thinking 
like your, um, you know, for my case, a guitar player. And thinking like a producer is being cognizant of everything else that's happening around you and how you fit into that context. Mm -hmm. and this is especially good if there's a singer involved. Mm -hmm. Because no matter what anyone says, the singer is the person in charge. If there's someone singing, you are there to support them uh -huh. and you are not there to like step on toes. I'm thinking like, how is what I'm playing, how does it sound in the context of everything else? Yeah. Am I supporting the singer? If there's not a singer, am I supporting whatever the melodic, you know, thing that's happening mm -hmm. and not overplaying and playing to the drums and the keys yeah. and locking in, that's the biggest sort of like secret weapon that will, you know, will get you gigs because yeah. people are not looking for necessarily someone who's incredibly technical or can mm -hmm. play fast or is a, you know, a big showman. Mm -hmm. um, it really starts with, you know, playing nice. <laughs> Yeah. with others yeah like when you started like going to jam sessions and like trying to figure all of that out is that like something you would just you would go like with the intention of like i'm going to this jam session to like work on these specific skills that can only be learned i think so i think i mean i treated them a lot for as like as networking as we all mm -hmm. should do like it's a really good way to meet other musicians mm -hmm. but yeah like jam sessions are tough because it's always a different group of people who who mm -hmm. like, likely have not really played together a whole lot. Yeah. So it's hard to think like a, it's hard to produce on the fly in yeah. scenarios like that. Mm -hmm. But you can do your best. I think it gives you a better ear. Maybe not like a, a you know, harmonic ear. It gives you a better ear in like listening what everyone else is doing. Obviously you, you do a whole bunch of gigs, but how, how did you start like playing wedding gigs? Like, do you remember like early like corporate wedding stuff? Yeah. How, how you got called or something like that? Initially in my career, I wasn't the first call, so I was yeah. typically getting called late for gigs, yeah. like the day before. And so then I was honing in on my ability to very quickly mm. assimilate into Whoa. a band that already had, you know, the first three calls not be able to make it. Yeah. I was very young, I was like still in college. I don't know how I got hooked up with, with this one wedding band, but they needed a guitar player and I, mm -hmm. and I played with them for like a summer of gigs, yeah. I think. Nice. And I didn't do very well because it was, they're like here and handed me like 60 songs. Yeah. The most of which I never played before. Yeah. Cause again, in high school I was playing metal music. Yeah. And then, you know, in a little bit of jazz and classical stuff. Mm -hmm. So like, that was like a new thing, like learning a book of music. Yeah. Uh, that wasn't a, theater production because I did yeah. that too. Yeah, I like noticed this trend that like, okay, I'm not the guy yet, yeah. but I'm being called mm. at all, which isn't great. Yeah. And let me just try to like do the best job that I can yeah. and kill it. And like a lot of those times I was able to make a, at least a good enough impression to get called back. And then maybe I was like the second call. Yeah. Um, so you get like a weekend. So yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, then I get like a little bit more time right, yeah. to prepare. Yeah, initially it was just kind of like a random call, um, mm -hmm. but they had you know heard of me playing at like some jam sessions around Pitt and stuff, yeah. and so that stuff gets out. And especially like if you're, you don't have to be the most technical player, but if you're showing up and you're like on time and you're, you know, a team player mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, you're not, uh, you're like supporting the band and not like trying to play over everyone. That stuff takes you light years further than, yeah. um, than technical ability. This is something that I really wish that I knew in like the time where I was really spending at home learning my craft. We have been so fortunate to grow up with this medium. We can look up anything, play anything, it, just jump into any era like that. Cool. That's great doesn't stop there. I feel like there's so many people that believe learning the cool licks is what's going to get them the gig. Mm. It's a part of the process, you know, what our idols have done, what, what the history of the music that we play. But there's another part that you don't get with that and that's community, right? Mm -hmm. Like most people don't understand that that's almost more important than the licks that you play. How good of a person are you? How willing are you to play from your heart and not your brain? We all want to know that killing lick. We yeah. all want somebody to be like, Ooh, yeah. like right <laughs> when you play that cool, like, yeah. man, I learned that last week and you want yeah. to talk about it. Like yeah. nobody cares about that. Yeah, yeah it's cool. Mm -hmm. But like, if you want to get a gig, you need to be hanging out with people who play gigs and getting that word of mouth in. I've had multiple musicians, touring musicians, professionals, legends, tell me to my face that it's all about the hang. 
What is music to you if you if you if you can't hang with the, the people that you're trying to create music with? It's this melting pot of relating to each other, having emotions, coming from the heart. But like, mm -hmm. if you're not having genuine hang time, how are you going to know these people, and how are you going to you know create with them in a place that feels genuine yeah. and like? That's the stuff that people are looking for, yeah. you know? It's the hang and being there with the people who are doing it. Yeah. yeah. You'll accelerate your chances yeah. of just getting a gig yeah. so much yeah. just by doing that. Thank you so much, man. You got it. <laughs> I appreciate it. So if you're a young musician that's looking to start gigging, here's some things that I would suggest. The first thing is go out to jam sessions. This has obviously been talked about a bunch in this video, but I think it's really important to get out and be a part of your local music scene. Going to jam sessions is not only a great way to meet people, but also just get good at playing your instrument with a whole lot of people that you don't know. Also, jam sessions are a great place to meet musicians who are already in the scene working. Now, there are a whole bunch of do's and don'ts for going to jam sessions. Maybe I'll make like a jam session etiquette video. Let me know if that's something you would wanna see. That's a whole other topic that I can't fit in this video. If you don't know where to find jam sessions, just start by Googling jam session in my city or find like live music venues in your city and kind of see what's going on. Just show up to any live music that's happening anywhere where you live and talk to the musicians that are playing. Tell them you're a young musician and you're looking to start getting involved in the music scene and you're kind of looking for jam sessions or places to play. Another thing you can do is just ask your band teacher, say like, hey, where are the local you know, music venues in town or where are jam sessions happening? A lot of times they'll know most of the working musicians in your local city scene and so you know they can tell you go to this session this person will be there tell them i sent you that's kind of a good way to get an easy in but if not just look it up you should be able to find something with whatever town you live in and this brings me to my second tip which is if someone invites you to sit in on one of their gigs you should make every effort to go play a lot of times when you're at jam sessions and you're meeting musicians that are already working you can ask them if they have any gigs coming up and a lot of times they'll tell you and sometimes they'll say hey bring your horn if you want to come out not only is it great to get to play with these musicians but you also kind of get some gig experience in the sense that you're not in a jam session environment and you're actually on a gig with someone who is doing it. I forgot to talk about wedding bands, so I just wanted to quickly mention two things. One way you can get connected with a band is just search wedding band in my city. Find a couple bands that come up and look on their website. A lot of times they'll have like either a section for musicians and information on how to audition with the band to get on their roster. Or sometimes they'll have like live showcases where clients will come to listen to the band to see if they want to hire them. And before that, they'll do auditions for musicians to come sit in with the band and, you know, see if they'll be a good fit. Another thing you can do is just ask people in the local music scene. So if you're already going out to jam sessions, and stuff chances are a lot of the local musicians know what the band is in town and then they'll be able to give you information on how to get involved anyways i just wanted to quickly mention that since i get a lot of questions about playing with a wedding band okay so my very first paid gig i think i was a junior or senior in high school someone had come to the music director at my school and said they were looking for a saxophone player to play while they proposed to their girlfriend the music director asked my saxophone teacher who declined it and said hey i have this young student that might be interested so i found out this guy was proposing to his girlfriend and wanted me to play careless whisper right when she said yes i met him at this cemetery that he was going to propose and i think it was like 4 p.m on a thursday or something he met me there early and he handed me this wig that he wanted me to wear i think i was wearing like a suit coat and then put on this wig which is actually the wig that you've seen in a lot of my videos i still use that wig for stuff that's where i got it he just gave it to me so he walked me down to the cemetery to the place that he planned to propose which was at this like tomb i guess of someone who i'm assuming was a musician it was like a small little building that you could walk into and the outside of it was like gated off and the gate was like music staves but that went all around the building so you had to like walk in and then you could walk into the building so he had me stand behind the building and kind of look through these windows so i could see when he was walking down with his girlfriend and then once he got close enough he wanted me to walk out and kind of start just noodling in whatever key careless whispers in d minor i think then he got down on one knee and proposed and as soon as she said yes he wanted me to just play careless whisper so that's what i did luckily she said yes it would have been really awkward if she said no I'm just like standing there in this wig and like uh, yikes there was a photographer there and everything so if i can find some pictures I'll try to put those up now. But anyways, I got paid like 75 bucks, I think, for that gig. So, you know, in high school, I was like, oh, this is cool. I get to play Careless Whisper while this dude proposes and I made 75 bucks. So that was one of my first paid gigs. And it just came to me through my teacher, basically. Let me know what other types of working musician videos you want to see. I don't really know what I'm doing with this series, but I'm getting a lot of questions and I just figure hopefully I can answer them with these videos. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.